Hey, Jesse. Hey, Bob. How's it going? Uh, pretty pretty good. How are you doing? Doing well. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging and TV. You are Jesse Single. You pronounce it like, like Singles Bar? I do, yeah. We have no idea where that name came from. Huh. Have you ever thought of opening up a bar that would be called <laughs> Single, you know, with an apostrophe S, Singles Bar? Yeah, well, if journalism uh, continues on its current trajectory, that might be a good idea. I would say a bar is a much better business model than journalism. If I were you, I would start thinking now about that. Uh, <laughs> I will. Um, so anyway, you are here. Uh, we can see that you're at the uh, at the Daily Beast Newsweek uh, headquarters in uh, the Big Apple there. Yep. Um, and looks actually it looks a little vacant i mean when i was there once it looked very vibrant and buzzing but but you you seem to be the uh the sole person in that little <laughs> cubicle area yeah if the, if the camera was uh pointed the other way you'd see some more people. oh really okay um so anyway you're here because you wrote this interesting article in the daily beast in fact about comments sections and how to keep them civil, if that's possible at all. And that's a subject of long-standing interest of blogging heads, um, for reasons that may be apparent when you look down at the comments on this very dialogue, although I'm actually pretty proud of our comments section. Um, it, the, the subject has grown in significance to me because uh, now I blog at The Atlantic where I have a comments section that I, I have to say through, possibly through no fault of the commenters there, is on balance appreciably more barbaric than the blogging head uh, comment section. And I want to get some tips from you on how to change that. Yeah. Um, I actually attribute it largely to the subjects that I'm discussing at on any given day. But, um, so how did you get, was this an, an interest of yours, comment sections, or did you just get the assignment? Yeah, a little bit of both. I mean, I, I was assigned the article, but... Um, I worked at the Boston Globe before for the opinion page, uh -huh. and I noticed that online, any hot button issue, abortion, immigration, gay marriage, um, reading the comments, you would just immediately lose your faith in humanity. And, and the level of sniping and anger, you, you just get some really resentful people. And there was, um, you know, a comment section can be a place for a really productive, healthy discussion, but that just that wasn't happening over there. And, and often at the Daily Beast, where we're changing our comment section, which is something I'll talk about more later. Huh. But, um, you get the same thing here with any, you know, I wrote a couple of pieces about Trayvon Martin, and see, I got 700 comments, which, you know, at first you're excited, people are talking about it, but 500 of them, like, should get somebody committed somewhere. Right. Uh, and, as you point out in your piece, I mean, there, there's a, a commercial upside to this sort of thing, because it does increase page views. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people told me that, um, you know, it depends on your specific platform and software, but there is some incentive there to just let anyone in the door posting nonsense, and then you get more page views. And you, and you get a page view like every time they come back and check to see if uh, if somebody's replied to them right. Although they may they may be using a comment system that's going to notify them automatically. They may not, but 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 in other words, the number of page views can far exceed the number of of comments. Yeah, that's my understanding. Um, so, okay, so what did you, uh, what okay. did you find? Yeah, I, I think a lot of this stuff actually goes back to social psychology and, and concepts like um, de-individuation, where if you have a big, messy group where people don't really have to portray themselves as themselves, and people know, you know, if I'm in a big crowd, I'm, I'm not really Jesse Single anymore. I'm a member of a big crowd. And psychologists have known for years that in situations like that, people will do stuff they wouldn't do otherwise. And particularly when you add anonymity into the mix, uh, it's amazing what people will say when you give them the veil of anonymity. And, and it's amazing in this very depressing, woe unto humanity kind of way. Okay. Now, I'm kind of... Uh... Is it really well established that anonymity contributes to the problem significantly? Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think it is, um, both from what we know about actual psychological research and just sort of intuitively. When you go to a site where it's easy to sign up and create new aliases and just sort of be a drive-by commenter, there's very little incentive to keep it uh, civil. Whereas uh, sites that sort of lock you into some identity, whether it's linked to a real Facebook account uh, or that just make you register and don't let you create new accounts whenever you want, 
you sort of have some type of reputation to hold, that people can identify what you're saying and, and criticize you for it. Right. I mean, there's a, there's kind of two issues there. I mean, drive-by commenting, you can stop just by requiring them to register and creating some delay, like a like a you know like a gun law cooling off period kind of thing. You know, <laughs> so they have to email you, and, and they're not going to hear back for an hour or something. Yeah. Um, the uh, anonymity is a separate thing, and the reason I was sounded a little skeptical that maybe that anonymity was a big part of the problem is that I've noticed that you know we used to have a system where pure anonymity was a lot easier um, on blogging heads now we're using discuss which I'm sure you're familiar with um, which which establishes it may link to your Facebook ID or in some other way it tries to establish your your actual identification um, we used to use an anonymous system and, and one thing we noticed is that when we would, like, threaten to ban someone, um, you know, it really, really bothered them, or if we right. did ban them. And, and that's kind of funny when you think about it, because they could just establish a new anonymous ID, right? Yeah. It, it, it's mm -hmm. like they, they, are, they are identifying very closely with their anonymous ID. Um, and, in fact, you could argue that that's the source of the problem. In other words, when they get insulted or when they feel they've been challenged or something, <laughs> they get all hot and bothered, as you only would if, if you thought your actual identity was under threat, right? I mean, I mean, like, as if you were in the real world and people saw who this was who was, who was being dissed. So, I, I don't know. I mean, there is now this trend to, to use systems that, 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 Argue that, that that supposedly preclude anonymity, right? But is there real data about uh, their success? You know, not that I know of in terms of the pure question of whether you're forcing people to link their account to their real identity. And I, I think I wasn't precise enough um, when I was talking about that because I, I think it's less important to the strict question of anonymity to me is less important than whether or not you moderate comments and give people an incentive to be reasonable and to be civil. I'm actually, I, I'm much more agnostic than I used to be on the question of anonymity itself, I mean, which I, I staunchly defended a couple of years ago, but uh, after a couple of years in the trenches, I, I don't think anonymity is as important as I used to. So you used to see some, some actual virtue in anonymity. Yeah, you know, I, I, in a column for the Globe a couple of years ago, I argued that it, it's important to give people that forum to say what they need to say, sort of whistleblower type stuff. But, you know, a given site, that's not a given site's responsibility. There's a million ways to say stuff anonymously on the Internet. Right. I don't think it's the job of the Daily Beast or the New York Times or the Boston Globe or any other outlet to provide that service. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so anyway, there is this... So much. Uh, so this trend away from anonymity. The, the perception is that it's having some success. Yeah, it, and it's hard to know. In a lot of these cases, you've sort of got multiple variables going on. I mean, if a site institutes a new system that involves both a move away from anonymity and heavy moderation, it's hard to know what's causing things to improve. Mm -hmm. My hunch is that moderation is really the key thing here. Um, it's it's expensive, it's resource intensive, unfortunately, but to build an online community where everyone respects each other and understands what will and won't be permitted, you sort of just need that human touch. Right. Um, and it is resource intensive, uh, although I have found sometimes a little a little can go a long way. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, and and on the um, on the non anonymous, is there a name for these that, that that like discuss that link your? Is there a, is there a generic term for comment systems that link to your actual ID or try to make that transparent? I, I think real ID maybe is real often ID? the term they use. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, how real is it? I mean, isn't it pretty easy still to set up? Like, I mean, you know, my dog has a Facebook. Uh, and and you're not supposed pets aren't supposed to be on Facebook. And I didn't I, I didn't give my dog the Facebook account. One of his his other fans did. But um, so aren't there very uh, you know isn't it pretty easy to game the system if you're really determined? Yeah, I, the key thing there is most people aren't really determined. determined. The right. sort of angry, resentful people who just want to post some garbage. You know, if you throw up a, a slight roadblock, a, a two foot high hurdle, they're probably not going to bother to step over it in most cases. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what is uh, what system is the Daily Beast going to? You said there's a change afoot. 
Yeah. By the way, by the way, I have to ask, like, your your piece was clearly widely read. There were like the Facebook recommends were in the hundreds, but I didn't see any comments below it. Yeah, I, it, it's sort of weird. I mean, you notice there were maybe a few dozen comments at the most. Oh, there were. Oh, see, I, for some reason, I saw I saw zilch. But anyway, maybe that was my. Yeah, but that, I mean, that is one thing weird thing you notice as a writer is some pieces get passed around on Twitter like crazy. Some people get passed around on Facebook, and you know, it, it's weird. Hard to tell what's going to do well where. Well, yeah, and I mean, the the ratio of like Facebook recommends to comments is is kind of an interesting thing. I mean, I've started to think that that's it's much better to have a high Facebook <laughs> uh, recommend to comments ratio than the other way around. I mean, the other way around often means just massive flame war going on. Yeah, exactly. That doesn't really tell you that people are um, reading closely or engaging in, in what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I think I interrupted myself. Uh, what What is the change afoot at, at uh, the Daily Beast? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm actually blanking on the actual name of it, but the basic idea is it's going to require you to log in using one of a variety of systems. Um, you can use Gmail, you can use Facebook, you can use something called OpenID. Right. Basically, you just need an email address, and, and it'll send you a little thing confirming that you're now part part of the club. Um, I think all people already who already comment get grandfathered in. And in addition to that, it's just giving them a lot sort of uh, beefier moderation tools. It, it's much easier to ban people, and, and they've no ways to ban not just a username, but anyone signing in from that computer. Um, I don't know if they use IP addresses or what, but it, it, the ban hammer, as, as nerds call it, is a lot heavier than it was in the old system. And I think they're going to use that pretty liberally for, for the most abusive commenters. And you have uh, full-time moderators there. Uh, we do not. We have a social media team, and I think they're going to be the ones initially responsible for um, doing some moderation. I'm not sure what the long-term plans are in terms of hiring full-time moderators. So right now, are they just um, paying attention to think comments that are flagged by other comments? Yeah, yeah exactly. The, the system hasn't rolled out yet, but it offers um, just much easier ways to flag comments. And you can flag them and say why you're flagging them. Mm -hmm. So that's a relatively laissez-faire system. I mean, yeah. for a big site, that, that's as hands-off as it gets, right? There is someone to look at flagged comments, but aside from that, you're on your own. Um, <laughs> But I, I think that reflects, you know, you're sort of trying to balance two competing desires here in every site. It's like, on the one hand, you want to give commenters a fair amount of leeway to launch whatever discussions they want to launch. Um, and, and to do so in a way where that doesn't really tie them down to the real life identity at all. But, you know, on the other hand, you do want a productive discussion. And, and I think the Daily Beast, like every site, is trying to figure out where the line should be between those two competing demands. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, at the other end of the spectrum of intervention... Is the New York Times, yep. and you, you you write about that in the piece, right? Yeah. And what what did you what did you find there? They they just have a very um, they have put a lot of time and resources into comment moderation. They have I think um, something like twelve moderators between full and part time, and and every comment posted to the site, someone takes a look at. It. Um, I think they have something like twenty hours a day of coverage. So if you comment at three a.m. No one's going to look at it for a few hours. But other than that, yeah, I mean, you can imagine they get a huge amount of comments and, and they look at each and every one of them. Um, and they have a pretty, in terms of actually what gets approved, they have a pretty laissez-faire system themselves. But the key thing is really bad stuff just doesn't get through. Mm -hmm. And is the deal, there was one site you talked about, I don't know if it's the Times, but where um, a new commenter will will uh, be moderated. In other words, someone is going to read your comment before it gets on the site if you're a new commenter, but at some point you've earned their trust and your comments go straight on the site. Is that the Times? They are, actually. Uh, that's a system where new commenters sort of get put on um, preemptive probation. Uh -huh. Once you're through the probationary period, you can post whatever you want. And then if, if you start having a history of unhelpful comments, you get put back on probation. Uh -huh. Um. That seems like a good uh, compromise. Yeah, again, that, that's at NPR. You said NPR.org. Yeah. yeah uh -huh. um, and the one thing that was interesting to me at the Times was uh, the criteria, right? I mean, in terms of the kinds of comments that are unacceptable, 
Well, well, you tell me. Uh, it was it was pretty broad, right? Yeah, I'm gonna actually pull that up because um, they basically make a point of allowing most comments and all but the most sort of abusive vitriolic stuff to like go through. And if you look at their threads, you know there's a fair amount of angry people, but you you don't see the sort of million exclamation points and racially tim stuff you see elsewhere so just again just putting that small barrier in place does really change the tone of the discussion but you're talking about the times now uh, yeah but they also they, they will they will they will keep your exclude your comment from being off topic right yeah and, no. oh, and, sorry. and interestingly to me well they said they would they excluded all caps comments which truly is one of the warning signs yeah, definitely. Um, but also, comments. Well, you well, you tell me what the language is. Uh, uh, cr it, not not just critical of the writer of the piece or of New York Times management, but uh, or maybe it was just being critical of them, right? They, they, they insulate the writer of the piece uh, from uh, more than than a lot of sites. Yeah, but uh, you know. I'm, I'm skeptical of, of any kind of censorship, obviously. That, that didn't strike me as unreasonable, because when I write about a hot-button issue on The Daily Beast or when I worked at The Globe, I would get really personal stuff uh, targeting me. Um, and a lot of it's just vicious and really has nothing to do with the topic at hand. So I, I, don't, I wouldn't view that as an attempt on the part of The Times to stifle debate. I think they're just, you've got to protect your writers. If you're going to have moderators anyway, protect your writers to some extent. Okay. Well, this is leads to some self-help I'm going to uh, advise I'm going to seek from you. Um, but, but first, we're going to take a commercial break. Okay, that actually wasn't a commercial break. It was because this recording system has been showing a tendency to crash every once in a while, sometimes like after 20, 30 minutes, and when that happens, you lose the whole recording. So I like to consolidate. I don't think that's likely to happen, but I thought I'd go ahead and consolidate what we had recorded and start anew. Um, so anyway, now the advice I seek from you, which is related to this this idea that the New York Times actually will exclude comments that are too critical of the writers. I, I you know, on my Atlantic blog, I was toying with the idea of putting commenter guidelines out there and saying, in theory, this is, you know, violating them as punishable through not only deletion, but but ultimately banning. And I was going to lay out these, you know, the, the, ha, these, these guidelines of civility that you had to uh, demonstrate in your communication with other commenters. Um, and, and I was thinking I might go ahead and say, and by the way, I expect you to treat me that way. Yeah. Do you think that's going too far? No, I don't. I think um, what, what the Times has shown and NPR has shown is that you need to get the right norms in place, basically. Like any any other neighborhood, this almost goes back to sort of a broken windows theory kind of thing. If you have the rules right up front saying this is what we expect of you. Refresh our memory. This is a James Q. Wilson theory, the broken windows theory, right? Yeah, yeah. The basic idea is um, repairing little aesthetic things in a neighborhood, repairing broken windows, getting rid of graffiti could have outsized effects on actual issues like, like crime. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, I think the underlying idea is, you know, we're very much affected by the local social norms. If, if the norms say litter and don't respect the neighborhood, that can have a cascade effect. Online, I think, you know, if you're in an online community where it's very clear what's expected of everyone, you're more likely to act in a civil way, and that community is more likely to attract people who are intelligent and who will act in a civil way. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, I mean, what, I think what you're saying makes perfect sense to say right up front, if you're going to comment on the site, this is what we expect of you. Yeah, I mean, the other problem is I don't have the resources to monitor very comprehensively, at least now. So I would have to say, look, enforcement is going to be sporadic. Don't come crying to me about how you, you were punished and the other person wasn't, because that's the way it's going to be. There's going to be injustice as a result of my lack of resources, okay? Yeah. Uh, do, I mean, is that, do you have any idea whether that would undermine the whole system? I, I think a better way to approach it would be to either post abusive comments and explain why you think they're abusive so that everyone can see. You know, you can hide their name if you want. Or something I've found to be surprisingly effective is if someone writes something really unhinged, just send them a perfectly kind civil email saying, like, could, could you expand on this? I don't really get what you're saying here. When you start to treat people 
as human beings rather than trolls, even if they're acting like a troll, you, you get unexpected results. That's true, but these are really resource intensive things. You, like, you want me to e personally email every crackpot? I would not wish that. I mean, that's like a full time job with all due respect. That's pretty a sporadic yeah. scattershot approach to that. Might, might bear dividends. But, um, yeah. Um, but you're right, because, I mean, often um, commenters. Uh, when they're talking about the person who is the writer or the person who's there on blogging heads, it's it's like they either don't realize that that person is reading the comments section or might read it, right. and, and so would take the insult personally, or they almost don't realize it's a real person. Oh, well, they don't at all. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. They, um, I mean, when you read this stuff, They'll again, any hot button issue, uh, com a lot of commenters do not act like they're trying to interact with another human being. They act like they're angry and resentful and want to get their view out into the world. It, it's not a real yeah, human conversation by any means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, so you, you, you encourage me to, I, you know, I feel a little awkward, like, deleting comments that are critical of me, just kind of no matter how... Take how, how absurdly critical or abusive they are. I always, I always hesitate to do that. But you're giving me the green light here. <laughs> yeah, with all, with all the authority vested in me by, by blogging ads, I'm giving you the green light to do that. I, I authorize you to authorize me to do that. It's very generous of you. I, I you know, I would say I wouldn't expect it to uh, lead to any miracles. But again, if, if someone doesn't act like a human being, when you raise them to that level and treat them like a human being, you, you'll be surprised sometimes. That wasn't my plan. I was I was planning to ban them and delete their damn comment, but but um, I could also I could also try treating them like a human being. I guess. Well, you know, if they if they if they won't stop, then ban them. But I'm just saying, maybe give them a chance. Yeah, but I mean, uh, I I don't want to go into too much detail. But on my Atlantic blog, there's a slightly separate problem, which is 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 <laughs> an ideologically coherent group of people uh, who who seem determined uh, to. Uh, <laughs> What was that? <laughs> Some kind of uh, meeting that, that I, I don't have to attend. That you're late for? Oh, um, you don't have to attend? Or is it that you're too important to attend it or not important enough? I'm, I refuse to answer that question. <laughs> um, anyway, enough about me in the Atlantic. I'm glad that Bell intervened. Let's talk about... Uh, let's talk about... Um, uh, this, this, this technological approach to solving the problem, which you write about, which I don't, I'm not sure I totally uh, believe in, but I've never seen it in action. So, so describe it. Yeah, it's called um, TLDR. It was created by a um, master's student at the uh, Berkeley School of uh, Technology, or Berkeley Long School of Information. The basic idea yeah. there is yeah, so I actually let the trolls that. do what trolls do, which is scream at each other, and figure out a way for people like you and Dave who want to have a substantive discussion to find that discussion. So um, if you just type in TLDR uh, comment, I mean, something like that in Google, you can see these really cool visualizations of how it works. Basically, um, he applied it to Reddit, which is a, a great link sharing site that um, I, mean, I think is actually a model for having online discussions. But what it does is analyzes the extent to which each comment gets voted up or down. Because um, on Reddit, you can do that. You can say, this comment is horrible and downloading it. This comment's great, I'm uploading it. It creates this big map that with um, sort of these spiky stalactite structures that are either coded red, I think, when they're helpful and long, engaging conversation, and blue if it's of quick burst back and forth, which would indicate a frame to the So, you know, if, if a system like this caught on, you wouldn't necessarily need moderators because anyone who went to use the system can say, I'm staying away from that part of the conversation. It's pointless. I'm going to go over here where the adults are talking. And the whole premise is of this is that the superficial structure of a conversation, how many words per utterance, you know, how many consecutive short utterances versus long utterances or medium sized utterances that that alone is a pretty reliable guide to the quality of the conversation. So that's what these researchers were hoping to do in the long run. Um, Reddit was kind of an easy test case because you already have the number of upvotes and downvotes for each comment, which is technology not every site employs. In the long run, once, uh, once computers get better at analyzing text, you, you know, there's already stuff you could look at. If, 
a two-sentence comment has a hundred exclamation points, it's very unlikely that that's a good comment. Um, but as actual analysis gets better, there's ways to really parse the text and say that this isn't a real debate. This is pointless. So, but right now, um, TL is it TLDR? Yeah, it's too, read? Wait, too long. Um, right now, it's relying on on what what kinds of cues? I mean, for starters, the ones I described, right? No, it's relying mostly on uh, upvotes and downvotes for a oh. comment. Oh, is it? I see. They said they had, they, the researcher told me that they had started to employ more textual analysis stuff, but they hadn't gotten very far. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, the whole project is sort of on hiatus just because they're all working on different stuff. Okay. Because the, I mean, upvotes and downvotes, I've found when a flame war is has ideologically clear dividing lines, yeah. uh, both sides, no matter how kind of barbaric the discussion has gotten and how personal, both sides can actually be getting uh, a, a, a lot of upvotes, right? Because because there's like two teams watching. Right. Um, that's true. I, I'd argue it, it's sometimes less true on Reddit, which just for some reason seems to do a good job of fostering substantive discussions. But I think that's why they want to work the textual analysis stuff in in the long run. Well, is it? Is Reddit a little ideologically coherent? I mean, I, I've never been there, but doesn't it have, first of all, a little bit of a libertarian kind of vibe? I think overall the vibe is liberal. There's like a hearty, very vocal minority of libertarians who always get, you know, psychotic Ron Paul postings on the front page. Um, but in general, I think people on Reddit do have a strong, cohesive sense of community and don't tend to download stuff just because they disagree with it, which is one of the things I like about the site. Mm -hmm. Because I think... Uh, the real, I mean, many, many, many sites are quite ideologically coherent on most issues. They're conservative, they're liberal, they're this or that. And I kind of think that uh, the challenge isn't so strong uh, there to keep things under control um, because you don't have so many sharp ideological disputes that get out of hand, yeah, right? But I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with that because the Boston Globe and the Daily Beast are both, strictly speaking, liberal. But the biggest problem on yeah. is, is really ideological commenters. I, I think conservatives are probably on balance a bigger problem on both sides. So I'm not sure whether or not the, um, the vibe of the publication itself is ideologically coherent, tells us much about how big a problem, problem commenting will be. Yeah, but the Boston Globe is only liberal in a really broad sense. Uh, you know, I mean, and it's largely a news site. So, so uh, and I would say the same thing about the Daily Beast. I mean, the Daily Beast has quite a variety of opinion. It, it may, there may be a, a clear balance in one direction, you know, clear, you know, uh, uh, an, uh, some sort of aggregate bias, but it has a lot of different um, opinions. So, I, so, you know, I'm thinking about something like The Nation or Daily Coast or National Review, which has a professed ideology yeah. is, it, and, and is all about opinion and not, not kind of just, just news, right? Yeah. I mean, but I think, go ahead. Well, uh, I would argue even on sites like that, um, you know, I, I did some weekend blogging for the Washington Monthly's Political Animal blog, which is, you know, a somewhat well-known liberal blog. And, and even there, you know, if you actually want a healthy debate, the fact that everyone's on the same side doesn't mean you're going to get that. You get a lot of people, you know, instead of Republicans, they're Republicans, just the stupid remarks over and over that just, you know. Right. Unsatisfying. Basically. Right. That is, that is the the other side of the trade off. Right. I mean, you, you you don't. I think in some of these ideologically coherent sites, you don't get the flame wars. You also don't get much, nearly the cross ventilation. Yeah. Uh, in terms of opinion, you can become just as stupid from reading those sorts of threads as actual flame wars. Right. And so, blocking heads has always had kind of a distinctive challenge because there's a fair amount of ideological diversity at our site, and I think we actually do pretty well. Uh, you know, on balance, we've 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 had our unfortunate exchanges, uh, but um, but I'm pretty I'm pretty proud of the commenters. I think, but that that reflects what I'm talking about in terms of social norms. Like, blogging heads gets the sorts of people who are willing to watch a, a 45 or 50 minute video about some like complicated policy issue. So it doesn't get a lot of people who are just there to call someone racist and move on. That's true, which, which leads, though, the exceptions to that uh, lead to the other issue with the web, which is that 
whenever you talk about the audience for a site, it doesn't have the kind of meaning this had 20 years ago when you talked about the audience for a magazine. There's just a lot more kind of horizontal traffic, people showing up at a place for the first time, reading part of an article, or, or just watching two minutes of a blogging heads clip. And I think that's, you know, we're back to, to almost where we started with drive-by traffic. Yeah, I, I think especially for those, you know, big search uh, engine optimization terms like Trayvon Martin or whatever, I'd estimate, you know, if you get 700 pump, maybe half of them are from people who actually read the article. Mm -hmm. um, finally, what do you think of, like, uh, I mean, do you think if you're going to be banning people and policing your site, it's really important to spell out criteria? You probably, you probably do think it's important to have, like, comment or clear guidelines, and you can always say this was deleted because you violated this bylaw. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think just having those guidelines in place. I mean, people are going to complain about getting banned all the time. People are going to complain about censorship, which obviously banning people from a website isn't censorship. Um, Thank but, you for that. I want to pause and reflect on that. There's so much confusion on that point, right? Whenever you argue that, you know, some view is whatever, uh, people, yeah, the term censorship should be applied to government denial of speech. I don't remember the part of the Constitution where it says you have a right to comment on the Daily Beast. It's not, it's not a good argument. So. Right. Sorry for interrupting you. Go ahead. That, that's a point that always drives me crazy, too. But, um, yeah, if you can point to a specific wall of text, even if it's got to be a wall saying you got banned because you violated this, I, I think that attenuates those criticisms a little bit. And, and you know, no one's ever going to be convinced, but at least other people can see, you know, this person didn't get banned because their ideology got banned because they didn't follow the rules. Mm -hmm. I guess you're right. I mean, every once in a while I'm tempted to just kind of change the whole metaphor for what a website or a blog is, like on my blog, and just say, like, it's more like, I mean, this is not a public square, first of all. It's definitely not a public square. But it's it's uh, it's a dinner I'm having. And if I don't want you here, you know, <laughs> I don't want you here. I don't have to tell you why. But you think that would be a mistake. Yeah. I, well, okay. So I, I buy the overall metaphor. Like, if I throw wine in your face, you're going to kick me out of your house. But I knew going in that I'm not allowed to throw wine in your face. Right. Um, right. So... Fortunately, with a lot of commenters, you need to put up a sign saying, don't throw wine in the host's face. But okay. Yes. So that's the solution. Put up a sign that says, don't throw wine in my face. That's simple. That's just one line. Very short. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, anything else uh, you want to you wanna add? Any, any uh, words of guidance for me or for the commenters on Blogging Heads? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I think commenters... If I write something or if you write something and, and commenters disagree with it, just make your argument. You, you don't need to scream at people all the time. And we're, you know, I, I sound like an old fogey when I say this, but we're very much in a media environment that puts a premium on screaming and name calling. And, and it, it doesn't get anybody anywhere. No one's ever convinced anyone that way. So, quite, the, quite the contrary, I would say. You're, you're less likely to convince. Absolutely, yeah. It, the trade off is between preaching to the choir and outreach. Uh, you know, b bringing in new converts, and and you can do one or the other. You can you can preach the choir, mobilize the base, uh, or you can, you know anyway the the uh, and that is we maybe we haven't been quite explicit enough about the types of of comments that that do get in the way. Um, I mean, generally speaking, we're talking about ad hominem stuff, right? I mean, if we're gonna you know kinds of bad comments, but it, it, can you? Break it up any more finely than that. I mean, are, are, somebody should do a taxonomy of ad hominem comment of ad hominem attacks, right? Yeah, there's obviously there's the most boring kind of trolling comment is saying, "Oh, you're a liberal, you would say that." Oh, you're a conservative, which is classic ad hominem. Then there's more specific stuff that attacks the writer directly that you know says something negative about the writer. Honestly, to me, the the most boring and annoying ones are the dumb preaching to the choir ones. Like it, again, if I see the term Republican one more time, and I say this as someone who's pretty liberal, it's just people think they're being very original, and and they're not, and it doesn't get anyone. Ever, and you're right. It, it it riles up the base. It's a way of saying, oh, we're all on the same team together. And, and to me, nothing could be more boring yeah. or worse use of the Internet than that. Or the term wingnut, and I say that as a, as, as a liberal. And I'd also say it didn't used to bother me as much. And also I would say there have been times when I was myself so riled up that I would see someone use the term wingnut and kind of feel, yeah, you know, but still on balance, 
you know, this is not uh, progress. Well, that's the difference between being informed and engaged and being a dilettante is either you call someone a wig nut and walk away or you actually engage them in discussion. Mm -hmm. I mean, another species of ad hominem attack is to, is to just question their motivation. In other words, you're actually making this argument because of X, Y, and Z. In other words, there's something other than your straight, than your professed purpose um, behind these uh, behind these remarks. Yeah, the classic example of that is when people are debating Obama's health care reform. Uh, conservatives can't buy the idea that Obama just thinks it's a good idea. It, it's part of his broader plot to have government control everything, which, again, is sort of a lazy conspiratorial argument. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and... Uh, by the way, you should feel free to wade in and, and, and uh, converse with our commenters. I will issue endless if, hominem attacks. If they say anything nasty about you, just make your presence known. Exactly. And give them a little, uh, give them a little love, and that's what caps lock is for. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was, I was always wondering what caps lock is for. I guess it was invented for comment sections. I've never had any use for it other than that. But question. So much uh, a slate piece on that. Yeah. What <laughs> the explainer? Why do we have cap locks? Okay. Well, thank thanks a lot. I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you get back to journalism at the at the Beast and or your new career as a bar owner, whichever. We'll see. One breaks. Okay. Thanks, thanks Jesse. Bye bye.